to everyone. I will have, as you can see, a small talk today about bringing down the dictatorship uh, two months ago since we started their uprising against Lukashenko after the election started. Um, hopefully, I'm not going to talk a lot. I'm talking normally quite fast. Today, I'm going to try to keep myself under control and it will last like maybe 45, 50 minutes and then we will have as it was mentioned, question and answer section. Uh, right. And I um, wanted to mention the trigger warning thing. I think this is an important part. Um, the things that are going to be mentioned are quite violent and they can be really triggering for certain groups of people. Um, so I wouldn't recommend to go further on with this presentation if you don't feel really secure. Good. Um, so to start talking about what is happening right now, we have to make a step back and understand a little bit the setup before the uprising in August. One of the first things to mention is this great country that is called Russia and Putin politics towards Belarus. Um, Belarus appeared eventually since the collapse of the Soviet Union as one independent republic. And since then it became an important zone of influence for Russian Federation and it never lost it. Um, zone of interest was manifested through, for example, small credit um, percentage or even getting oil or gas for some lower costs than the market. So all of those things were kind of like pushing Belarusian economy, but from the other side, we're getting the political loyalty from Belarusian regime for the last 26 years. Uh, one of the other interesting parts about the regime was that at the end of the 90s, Lukashenko, back then, I think the first president term, signed a common deal with Russia about uh, becoming some kind of a union state, not becoming one Russian federation, but rather having this roadmap where Belarus will be integrated in the Russian economy, there will be a common currency, and so on and so forth. And that was one of the projects that was supposed to give a lot of money for Lukashenko and he was supposed to give this kind of like smaller steps of giving up independence of Belarus. Um, and Lukashenko, while building his political power, was not going to give it away, you know, building out the dictatorship just to give it back to back then Yeltsin, later on Putin, was not in his plans. So he was using this, let's say, state, right, union state uh, for as long as possible. Till, um, I mean, when Putin came to power, uh, the things didn't go really brilliantly. If Lukashenko was really nice with Yeltsin, with Putin, they were never friends. And back in 2010, there were huge problems with between Putin and Lukashenko. And slowly this subsidized gas and oil got, were going down. And step by step, Putin saw that he's not getting anything from basically like supporting the Belarusian economy, he's not getting, getting anything. And as a result of that, for example, the free loans disappeared or uh, the gas prices and the oil prices went up to the normal market prices. So all the cookies that Putin was giving to Belarus were disappearing. And this of course affected the Belarusian economy. Um, so since I think like 2013, 2014, Lukashenko is really struggling to keep the economy afloat. And in 2015, he started working really close with the European Union. Uh, and the European Union started paying back for his kind of political sw uh, switch from we are all Russians or we are brothers with Russia to uh, now being like an independent state with independent people who are friendly with Russians, friendly with Europeans, but we are like independent. So for that, European Union started since 2015 pumping into Belarusian economy also money, millions and millions of euros, starting from security sector, police, border guards, also paying for building up the refugee camps to kick out the refugees from the European Union into the now not anymore dictatorship for the European politics, uh, politicians. So this all came to 2020 where from one side Belarus was getting a lot of credits from European Union, from IMF and trying to keep the, let's say the falling apart economy. And from the other side, Russians who were um, taking more and more away of those cookies that were keeping the Belarusian miracle, economical miracle afloat for the last 26 years. 
as a result of that, in the first um, couple of months of 2020, the Belarusian currency went up, I think, like 20% or something like that. And um, then coronavirus hit. And when coronavirus hit, um, everybody forgot about the economical problems for a moment, but um, the government. So the government continued saying first that there is no coronavirus. Belarusians are really special people. They can drive tractors. They can go to Banya, drink vodka. Everything will be fine. Um, however, the situation went so bad that it was not possible to ignore it anymore. And when um, the thing started in April, by the end of April, Lukashenko completely changed his rhetoric from there is no coronavirus to, okay, there is coronavirus, but we won't start having any, I don't know, any measures to fight it back because, um, and he mentioned that we have problems in economy and we can't afford to have any kind of strict measures, um, any quarantine or something like that. So back then he made it clear that it's not about politics or any kind of a concept to fight coronavirus. It is basically about surviving for the Belarusian state during the crisis. Um, so a lot of money were eventually gathered at that period from people to people. The Belarusian state said, okay, we don't have so much money to finance, for example, the healthcare um, sector. As a result of that, some crowdfunding campaigns started where people were gathering money for the basic things like buying masks. So in Belarus, there was no shortage of masks, um, but for the medical personnel, it was not possible to buy those masks because there were not enough money. And those money came from Belarusian crowdfunding campaign from within the country, but also from Belarusian diaspora from outside of the country. And um, around this kind of a small self-organizing group, the bigger and bigger layers started building up on, for example, smaller business providing um, healthcare sector with food for free and uh, transport and so on and so forth. So at the time when the coronavirus was really hitting Belarus hard in April and May, the parallel infrastructure to fight coronavirus to Belarusian state was formed from like self-organized groups that were basically running the alternative healthcare support groups. And this played an important role in like some kind of a first uh, wave of understanding that the Belarusian state is not something that is going to take care of everything. It is this um, institution that in the times of crisis cannot actually help us. And the only people that can help us is ourselves. And this build up this certain type of autonomy in the heads of people, that they can do things by themselves, that they don't need the Belarusian regime to help them to take care of the things. And that's how it came actually in May to um, the point of another big political, um, how would you call it, big political turmoil when the Belarusian government announced that there will be elections coming up. It was known before that the elections will be there um, and it was not clear when they will happen. So um, the government came and said uh, three months before in August we will have elections and everything will be fine and we are happy people and so on and we don't have crisis. And this um, provoked another kind of a wave of political and social engagement. Um, at the beginnings, um, they gave, I think, couple of on, only a couple of days for the candidates to register and start collecting signatures. And some of the people were not um, actually allowed to register, others were. It was not really like a legal frame. They were just, you know, saying, you are not allowed, you are allowed, um, depending on your political views or radical political views. Um, and in May, when the signature collection started, certain candidates um, that were opposing Lukashenko in the elections started using signature collection spots around the city as rally points. And this was one of the life hacks that was invented back then because in Belarus, it's practically impossible to get uh, permission to organize a rally or something like that. Um, so they use those signature collection points um, for open mic and for rallies where they would give speeches. I think at the beginning, nobody understood how crazy it would go because at the first kind of an organized event, thousands of people came and this was unexpected for Belarusians um, at all. And those thousand people came quite 
um, politically motivated. So there were a lot of speeches, not only from politicians, but also a lot of speeches from normal people who were saying how they were fighting with coronavirus, how the whole situation economically going on badly and so on and so forth. And um, this format actually spread all around the country. So step by step, this, the, this kind of possibilities to gather and start talking about politics started taking different cities. And at a certain point, the government understood, okay, this is a threat. And one of the candidates who was, I think, the biggest kind of a wind in this sail uh, was arrested on some kind of made up charges where they made a hustle with the policeman who fell down and now he's charged with attacking the police and so on. So he was kind of kicked out from the politics. And then another person came into the game who is a former banker. And he said, okay, I'm going to participate as well. Um, and I'm not the street fighter or going to fight Lukashenko on the streets. I'm just the simple guy who is for reforms, who is like a really moderate, I'm really rich. I don't have to be corrupt and um, so on and so forth. And all the people um, started rallying around him. And I think he also didn't expect this kind of a support, but this was like a momentum out of coronavirus crisis and many other problems in the country. So he got this massive support and the government saw, okay, now he's uh, a problem for us. So he got arrested and he was arrested also on the corruption scandal and so on and so forth. And um, as a result of that, this kind of like big politicians were kicked out from the game and a bunch of people who were around them were also kicked out, uh, not kicked out, but rather put in jail. And at that point, um, the wife of this blogger, Tikhanovsky, um, Svetlana Tikhanovska came into game and she said, okay, I'm no politician. I'm no, like, I'm not fighting for presidency or something like that. I'm running to do the re-elections to basically like win over Lukashenko at this election round. And then in the next couple of months, do the new election round without Lukashenko with the elections that where the votes are at least counted. And this created um, this possibility for a lot of different campaign managers to join together. So from those people who got arrested and say, oh, we are going to do it together. So we are going to kind of unite all the political powers in the country that are fighting against Lukashenko. And we are going to push um, Tikhanovska as our candidate um, to get those new elections. And this worked really well because eventually the Belarusian government is extremely sexist. I mean, Lukashenko is kind of like this alpha tier um, who, or alpha animal who is basically like thinks that women cannot do anything, right? They can do the cooking and that's it. And this was his mistake. So he underestimated Tikhanovska and her team that started rallying um, also all around the country. So she got signatures for um, becoming the candidate and she became the candidate. And then the next step of like life hacking the Belarusian legal system is eventually using rallies to meet the, with the candidate. And what they did is they started registering different spots all around the country in different cities, not coming by themselves, but just saying, okay, you can go to this place. This is like a legal gathering. You don't have to um, go to prison for that for 15 days or something like that. And people started showing up and there were no kind of political leaders to give speeches and tell them what to do, but rather it was like the spaces with an open mic and conversation and people talking to each other about politics and organizing and actually um, fighting back. And in certain places, um, anarchists were kind of one of the leading forces of like this pushing self-organization, pushing um, dialogue on open mic possibilities or this kind of people's assemblies or whatever you call it. So with that happening, what was happening also um, and underestimation of those protests and underestimation of the women candidates, uh, in certain cities, police started showing initiative and started trying to detain some people. And there was one case when uh, police tried to detain just one person and what is how the police detains people in Belarus is that they have this kind of events uh, which they drive through the city normally uh, before it was without plates now they have different plates so they drive through the city with in the van and they jump out of the of the van for a moment they grab one two people throw them into the van and they drive away it's kind of like a bandit gang thing that you can see in some movies so they do that and, and they did that for 
last, I don't know, 15 years and nobody was resisting. What happened now is in this small town of, I think, Rodina, people started resisting. So they jumped out of the, of the van, they grabbed a couple of people and the whole crowd went against them and they started beating the policemen and they started resisting. And this was the first time when the cops were shocked and started running away. And then the same scenario happened in Minsk, but in the bigger group. So there were, I think, like 30, 40 cops that were jumping into the crowd trying to detain some people and people went full-scale fist fighting. I mean, there was like a sparring, tie boxing, whatever you call it, um, beating up on the streets. And the cops in Belarus at that point are not what you know, I think, in Western Europe, like these helmets and shields and so on. They're jumping out in some kind of summer uniform. They have short... Um, they have a t-shirt, they have like uh, sport uh, pants and they don't have any equipment. So when they are getting beaten up, they're just like, I don't know, some guys on the street who wanted to fight with you. Um, and this works really good. So it's, it plays a really important um, momentum inside of the society. This, mo this myth about the Belarusian cops um, that was created in the last 26 years, that they are so tough that they are like built up to maintain order and law on the streets is vanishing within like a couple of weeks. People start understanding that they can fight back. They can actually, well, they can actually win over their own positions um, in this game of repressions that the Belarusian government is pushing. And this is happening between July, no, June and August. Demonstrations that are gathering thousands of people, the highest, pom uh, the highest point is one week before the elections, there is uh, 60,000 people in Minsk, which is basically like the biggest demonstration since collapse of the Soviet Union that are coming um, on the meeting with Tikhanovskaya. And Lukashenko is just basically ignoring the, the whole thing that is happening, that there is like this political momentum building all around the country, not only in Minsk, and his all propagandists are also losing the, the, gra the grip over the reality, I think. And a couple of days ago, uh, before the elections, there are several rallies planned again. And at that point, they understand, okay, we have to stop those rallies. And they start um, repressing those rallies and also preventing people from gathering. And this is even giving more um, anger uh, because people were rallying through all those months um, through like with their political ideas and so on and so forth. And then suddenly um, it comes to this point that they can, um, they cannot anymore because Lukashenko decided that they cannot. Um, right. And then a couple of days of those um, repressions, we are coming to the point of day of elections when again, the government is completely misunderstood the situation. They brought... Uh, cops from all around Belarus to Minsk, expecting this traditional big rally happening in the capital, the regions are away, and um, there the idea was to basically suppress the movement at the day. and the evening, basically destroy all the opposition, destroy all the resistance, crash it in one day, and go back to the reality where everybody goes to work next day. So that was the strategy. Here you can see on the video, like the cars and cars coming from uh, all around the country. This is the one of the entrances to the city. A lot of entrances to the city were blocked by the militaries uh, that day. And um, starting from the day of election, the internet was um, blocked. And um, it was basically like this momentum of complete closure. So the government starts like a full-scale repression on all the directions. Uh, during the day of election, a lot of people are getting detained. They are getting detained in front of election uh, stations. They are also getting detained somewhere in the city. The cops are running in their, uh, driving in their vans around the city, just jumping on some smaller groups of men and grab them back into the car and drive away. So it's kind of like an atmosphere of governmental state terror happening. But this happens again only in Minsk. So all of this is in Minsk. And um, before they switch off the internet, before they go into this full-scale lockdown, um, the plans are already published. And the plans are that we are meeting uh, all at the election stations. And, and in the evening, when they are closed at 8 o'clock, we are all going um, to the city center. 
to get like a bigger demonstration. So there are a lot of this dozens and dozens of election stations all around Minsk and a lot of places um, outside of the capital where people are gathering and it's really hard for police to control those places. They can control one, two, three, five spots, but so many uh, decentralized places together was not possible to do. And this worked really well for the people. Uh, and the other point was to wait till the polls closing because there are first results published within like 15, 20 minutes. And this was the first moment when we saw that this consolidation of power, which is really important for democracy to exist, um, started giving crack. In the last 26 years of the elections, or let's say 20 years of elections, um, the election results were always giving as the government says. So there are res certain results that are given to those election stations. They should publish those results and that's it. And Lukashenko gets always like 80, 90%. But in the certain places around Minsk and in other regions, they started publishing real results. The real results that were given Lukashenko only 12, 15, 20% of the voters. And this created another momentum where people were like, okay, the regime is not so strong anymore. It's actually collapsing on itself. And we should push as hard as possible to eventually put their last nails in the coffin. And when the protest started uh, and people started going to the, to the city center, they saw that the city center is basically under lockdown completely. There is a barbed wire. There are this... Um, fences that are built for the police to control the area. There are thousands and thousands of cops on the streets. And um, the first places, the, the first people that started showing up were um, detained. And at certain point, the resistance also started forming up against those um, cops. Uh, so bigger groups of people started gathering together and actually attacking back the cops. And um, well, the first time in last 20 years started clashing with the police. And those groups were um, really shocking the Belarusian police because the Belarusian uh, police, although well prepared for the streets in theory, was never dealing with um, aggressive crowds, with the people who are actively resisting to the police. So they were all shocked and they um, basically ran uh, on the ran towards their vans and uh, started putting their riot gear and coming back to the streets. But this moment for a couple of hours where people were actually like pushing the cops back and fighting them and not only fighting, but basically winning the streets over from the police was a really important for a collective morale. And as the police understood that there is a lot of resistance on the streets, they started trying to readapt their strategy. So from this single arrests, they went into the full-scale kind of a repression mode that is more common in big-scale riots. They started forming these huge lines that were um, pushing the people away. They started using within a couple of, uh, within the half an hour, they came from just hanging out with the shields. They started throwing um, stun grenades. They started um, using rubber bullets, water cannons. So everything that they had in their um, arsenal was just basically pushed on the streets. So you could see that they were panicking at a certain point because they started using all their toys really fast. And at that point, the situation escalated um, really hardly with really a lot of people who were um, injured and a lot of people who were sent um, to the hospitals even without being arrested. Uh, right. And um, as I said, the violence went to the extent that over 150 people were hospitalized. In the evening, 3,000 people were um, detained by the police and brought to the different uh, police stations and uh, prisons inside of, the, uh, inside of the city. What was happening also that in the other uh, places around the country, people also went on the streets and there they won the streets in many places because the cops from that cities were in the capital. Um, a lot of places were left with, I don't know, a bunch of cops who were looking into the crowds of one, 2,000 people. There was a funny situation in one of the smaller cities that was called Pinsk, where one of the people wrote a kind of a report, right, a happily report about what happened in their city. 
and he wrote that um, yeah, we went on the streets. There were there's a bunch of maybe like 20, 30 riot cops with their shields, and we were a huge crowd. And we decided, okay, it's now or never. We beat up all the cops. They ran away out of our city. We have shields uh, and all their equipment now, and we are coming tomorrow back to the streets because it's our city. And this kind of situation were happening all around the country that the people were taking over the streets. However, the repressions were also pretty hard. As I said, 3,000 people in the first day, 2,000 people on the second day of the protest, and 1,000 people at the third day of protest. People were basically like just en masse collected in the prisons, and prisons were completely overcrowded for this before the trial detention. Um, there were even some performances to show how it looked. Um, so basically like a cell for five people was filled up with 50 people and you just stand, stand in it. Like you can't lay down, you can't sit, you basically stand the whole time in, in the cell. And that's the situation that people were put for days uh, of being like so packed. Um, and at least five people were killed during those first days of the protests. Some people were killed um, directly on the streets with like rubber bullets and um, the what was the other thing? Yeah, just rubber bullets and the gun. One person was shot with a firearm and the other people were um, killed under really bizarre circumstances. First they disappeared and then later on they were found, for example, hanging on the tree in the park. And this brought another wave of like huge, let's say, anger inside of the society. Um, the prisons themselves became also a really crazy point of the regime. Before, I mean, there was a little bit of violence going on inside of the prisons and people were prepared for that violence. But the violence that was put on the people in the first days after the, the elections was beyond comprehensions for everybody. So all of those thousands of people were beaten up in these corridors of pain where they would like bring the people to the prison, unload them from the cars, and between going to the car and the prison, you would be hit by the, every cop that you meet on the like through the corridor. Um, also inside of the prison, they would sort the people out in their own fucked up um, logic where they would say okay this person didn't resist at all so we don't mark him this person she was resisting a little bit so we are going to put yellow cross on her with like a tape or a paint and this person was resisting a lot or she looks like a punk so we are putting a red cross on her and that means that she's getting like the most um, treatment so she's getting beaten up uh, at, like mostly and um that's how they were like applying their violence and the violence was going on from just basically like beating up until your until their hands were blue and they couldn't beat the people anymore up to the point of raping people um, just because they were not given the passwords from their smartphones. And this violence was applied not to a smaller group of people. This violence was applied um, on, as I said, thousands and thousands of people. So taking that in account, it's basically like every knows, every, everybody knows someone who was affected by this violence in the country. And it's really hard to, let's say, censor it. Um, talking about the prisons and the whole torture story right now, the violence got decreased. So in the first days, it was like really above whatever um, anybody could imagine. Um, right now it went down, but it still happens. Um, so people who are getting detained and who are ending up in prison are still some kind of sorted. So some people are not getting any kind of special treatment and they are left on their own for whatever time they are supposed to spend in the prison. And some people, for example, an anarchist or the special group or an anti-fascist is another special group. Those are the people who are getting really beaten up. And one of the friends, for example, couldn't lay down for a couple of days because he was beaten up so hardly by the um, political police. Um, right. And what happened after the first three days where people were building barricades and actually actively resisting and fighting the cops uh, on the streets, um, on the fourth day, uh, the march of the women was planned where um, the idea of de-escalation came up. And this was, uh, I think, an important moment uh, for the protesters to bring down this okay, we are going full scale on the streets, rather um, we are going um, 
right now in a certain way peacefully. Uh, and with that, a lot of people went to the streets that were not there on the first days. And the people who were there on the first days could have like a couple of days off just to have like a breathe out. So we thought. Um, so the escalation happened really rapidly in the sense of, you know, on I think Tuesday and Wednesday, they are still beating up us on the streets and they are applying a lot of violence. And then next day, there is this bigger crowd of people who are completely ignored by the police. So there are no cops on the streets. Nobody's ha nothing is happening. Nobody's arrested. And the women start gathering every day and they are wearing these traditional white clothes and not traditional, just white clothes with the red roses. And they are um, there clearly against the violence. And at that point, violence is mostly about the police violence. So nobody's saying, yeah, those horrible people that were fighting the police, rather that it goes completely against the police violence. So people try to um, protest that. But at a certain point, it starts changing the mood inside of the protest as well. This kind of like anti-violence agenda. And after a couple of days, and the protesters start, although gathering a bigger momentum than in the first days, people start um, ser um, searching for provocators inside of the crowds. And this becomes, uh, this makes participation inside of the demonstrations for the anarchists a little bit more complicated. So we are now seen not as uh, the people who are participating rather than we are provocators that are, I don't know, provoking the police or whatever. Um, and this is happening plus minus till now, although the women marches were um, repressed in the last months completely and they are not happening, but this anti-violence discourse that appeared after the first three days is now still there and the people are still believing that if you are trying to de-arrest someone um, this is a violence that can provoke even more police violence at least some people it's not like the biggest crowd of the people but inside of the of the protest movement those people are sometimes the loudest and this makes the whole protest a little bit more complicated um, what happened also in the first days is that a lot of people who were detained were in any way associated with some factories and they were part of the working class. So the workers saw that their um, colleagues disappeared and they don't know what happened to them. And there is a lot of news about violence and killed people. Um, so a lot went on the streets and said, okay, we're not going to work until we get our answers. This was, I think, the first strike movement since the beginning of 90s as well. And this brought another kind of like, wow, crazy. The workers in Belarus are somehow political power. And I think uh, the workers themselves were surprised that they can bring so much pressure. Um, as a result of that, in the first days, over 50 state-owned enterprises went on strike. Um, some went like on a full strike, like a general strike, but the others were working in a certain like halfway. Um, even the miners in Belarus went on strike, which is also like a legendary group, the working group that can fuck up some things. Um, so this was happening, I think, the first week and everybody were um, really let's say, hopeful about this because the workers can eventually affect the government in a really hardcore way. Who also went on strike was, uh, were people of the um, state propaganda apparatus. In Belarus, most of the media is actually controlled by the government. You don't have independent TV. You don't have independent radio stations. Most of the critical, um, most of the information critical of the regime is aggregated on the internet and all of those newspapers, TV, radio are under control, although there are a couple of newspapers that are independent yet still. Uh, and so the workers of the TV and certain governmental newspapers and radio went on strike as well. And they said, okay, we want to report the reality that is happening on the streets. And to give you an understanding what was happening on the streets with the difference with the media, while the riots were happening, while the whole crazy things were happening in the prison, Belarusian stations were um, doing the operas and some cultural events and so on and so forth. So it was like a huge explosion of reality between these two situations. Um, 
and they went on strike and this paralyzed a little bit the Belarusian propaganda machine as well. Also the workers of culture went on strike, like the theater workers and so on. And um, all in all, what happened afterwards is um, that for some time Lukashenko was actually ignoring the whole strikes, but then he decided to go to the, one of the factories and then this happened. And um, in the video, you can hear workers shouting something and they were shouting, go away. So this was um, the embarrassment situation that happened first time to Lukashenko in this kind of setup where he was trying to show that he's taking care of the workers and everything is fine. And instead of that, workers started protesting him and shouting him, go away. And this went all around the world. And everybody thought, okay, this is the end. You know, like after such an embarrassment, you can't just go on and say, I'm the strong leader. I'm going to lead the country to the bright future. Um, what he did um, after that, he actually started repressing the workers and um, a lot of working, a lot of factories um, stopped striking and it went, well, not in the best direction. Um, so right now the workers movement is completely s suppressed, let's say like that, and there is no evidence that it can be renewed because um, the workers who were pa um, participating actively in the resistance uh, were kicked out from the working places or they had to leave the country because of the repressions and those who are left on the factories the few who are trying to organize seems to not have such a strong uh, positions that they can actually bring workers back on the streets and start strikes and so on um and meanwhile the while the women march is happening and the workers striking, um, the, after one week, the Sunday march called, the first Sunday march. And this is the moment where everybody is getting extremely surprised because on the streets on a Sunday, over 300,000 people come in Minsk and um, dozens of thousands in uh, regional um, capitals and in the smaller cities, thousands of people go on the streets. And this becomes like the biggest, basically, protest Sunday in the whole history of the country. I think this was like even bigger than October Revolution back in the, in the times. Um, so this creates a momentum that is still lasting um, right now. And people are going on the streets still remembering this positive momentum that happened, although uh, the, the amount of people went a little bit down. And inside of these demonstrations, again, the same debates happens as with the women marches. The violence that we don't want to have people in the black clothes, we don't want to have people black clothes in the rucksacks, and so on and so forth, which is making a little bit harder and harder and harder to resist anything that police is doing on the streets. Um, after this week of a really big protest against the police violence provoked by the police actions in the first three days, the government changes the tactic of repressions. They stop actually creating these images where they are violent, where they're killing uh, people. Um, they actually release most of the people they detained in the first days. So out of the 6,000, I think 95% um, are released or something like that. Um, there is There are a lot of compromises made. Like in one of the cities, actually the uh, local protesters get a permission together at the city center without any permission and they're getting um, time and the local media so they are becoming kind of a setting up force inside of the city and the repressions kind of like extremely go back but they start slowly step by step building up um, first they take a care of the really small cities where the protest was going on and then slowly they start building up the protest uh, the repressions in the bigger cities. Uh, by the moment I'm speaking right now, this is 17th of uh, October, um, the protests in most of the cities around the country are um, destroyed, smashed. Uh, the protests in Minsk are still happening. And in some, let's say, the biggest protest points that were happening before, you might have like 100 people, 200 people going on the streets, getting detained, and that's it. So right now we have most of the protests actually repressed, but the Sunday demonstrations that are happening right now in Minsk and are going to happen tomorrow. And we will see what is going to be the result of that. 
many people want to know who are the leaders of the protest. This is like a really often asked question in the internet. Who are those leaders? And it is important to understand that there are no clear leaders. Those politicians from the right or from the left that could become leaders are now sitting in jail, arrested under organizing riots or participating in the riots, or financing or whatever. So there are no leaders. It, the structure is completely self-organized uh, and mostly actually happening on the social networks. Telegram is, became, is becoming like the biggest thing. Um, and I think it plays the kind of the same role as it played in Hong Kong. So an organizational platform, but also a content platform. And as a result of that, like no leaders, no uh, clear structures to repress. The government is repressing just the bigger crowds. Um, certain media resources are playing an important role in the protest. Um, so they, the information that they are publishing can provoke people towards the protest or can bring the protest down. But in general, um, there are no talking hats that are calling people to the barricades or otherwise not going to the barricades and so on and so forth. Um, there are certain people that think that anarchists are leaders inside of the movement, which is not the case. Uh, although the government is saying that the movement is led by the anarchists and anti-fascists and football hooligans. Um, but it's, it's not the case, and I will tell you a little bit further why. Um, certain communists and certain leftists, let's say like that, um, think that the situation that is happening in Belarus is some kind of a CIA coup or a Mossad or some other whatever, I don't know, British MI5, 6, whatever number. Um, it is not the case. Um, it is like one of the important parts to understand if there are no leaders, if there are no political parties involved for the CIA or for any other political power from outside, it is extremely hard to find allies. You need a people that you are going to push into the power, right? Through those coups. And uh, for now, there are no groups that can be supported. And also um, CIA is now busy with something, with some other things and Belarus is not such an important um, player for US right now, actually. Um, yeah, what's up with Putin? Um, as I mentioned before, Putin was um, playing an important role supporting Lukashenko, but then Lukashenko went uh, together with the European Union until elections. Lukashenko was actually saying that Putin is trying to bring him down. So all the oppositional activity that was happening first time in the history of the country was planned not by the European Union, US, South Africa or whatever, but by Russia. And they even detained several uh, Russian extremists, terrorists that were planning direct actions in Belarus in the, I think this happened in July, at the end of the July. But the thing is that um, when Lukashenko applied those repressions, he had to search for allies, not in European Union anymore. And that's when it came to this point that, oh, Putin, my friend, we are back friends, right? Um, so they started calling each other again and they started, uh, I don't know, dating apps and so on. So Putin became an important supporter of Lukashenko at that point. And uh, a month ago, Putin promised uh, $1.5 billion uh, for um, Belarus as a, as a credit to refinance the, another credit, but also to support the whole repression apparatus that is happening right now. Um, there was also talks that uh, Russia will bring uh, the police to Belarus to support their colleagues. There are agreements for that. And actually for quite some time, the uh, Russian cops were situated at the Belarusian borders on the Russian side, waiting for the moment to um, come to Belarus and suppress the movement. Also, Putin um, gave uh, Lukashenko as a replacement for the striking media workers, his best journalists that are coming from Russia today. So he gave, um, I think, a dozen of journalists that replaced the other ones. And now it's called Belarusia Today. Um, a joke about that. And they are also a fucking horrible story. But eventually Putin supported the Belarusian propaganda machine to survive through this whole crisis. And they're still there and they're still producing news. And you can always find the funny stories of comparison to where it's like the way they're speaking or the way they're describing the situation and so on. As for the leftists, um, everybody wants to know what, what the leftists are doing. Um, the leftists in Belarus are a really complicated point. 
from one side, uh, you still have the Communist Party that is a remnant of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. They are completely supportive of Lukashenko. They are going on the streets with their flags and doing pro-Lukashenko rallies. They are a marginal group inside of the politics. Um, the other side of the communists um, is also like no clear presence on the streets, nothing. And those are like a group of 10, 15 people who don't have any political presence at all. The socialists are present in some political parties, but they were pushed out of the streets as well. And the traditional Western left, whatever that means actually um, for different countries that are listening to that, doesn't exist at all. There is no this bright future where we are all going together with Trotskyists, Maoists and so on. Rather that um, everybody is kind of in their own political camp, apart from maybe some anti-authoritarian Marxists that are dragging behind the anarchists. But the political spectrum is really clearly divided. And most of it that is already occupied in the Western Europe or in the Western hemisphere by certain communists or Marxist groups is mostly dominated by the anarchists. Um, I don't want to brag about that, that the anarchists are the biggest um, power in that direction, but it is the case. Um, the other, I mean, the other groups had an existential crisis. I mean, from one side, you have to fight against Lukashenko, but from the other side, he is kind of fitting in certain ideologies of the left. And you can see that also right now during the protest that a lot of leftists are supporting Lukashenko because he is the greatest anti-imperialist leader that can happen to the Eastern Europe um, in their heads. Um, so the anarchists. The anarchists are um, for last, I think, five years, seven years is the only, not the only, but one of the few political powers that was still present on the streets that was doing some street actions, that was doing graffitis or whatever, and still doing some kind of political agitation. What happened to the traditional political opposition is that they left the political struggle in 2015 after Maidan, thinking that Lukashenko is actually better than um, starting the uprising and getting into the same situation that Ukraine ended up in 2014, 2015 with the Russians invading basically Eastern part of your country and trying to take it over. Um, so the anarchists stayed on the streets and um, for last 10 years, or, well, not last 10 years, I mean, last 20 years or since the collapse of the Soviet Union actually, were playing an important role in the political changes in the country. So whatever was happening, the anarchists were always there with their agenda and so on and so forth. And this created a narrative inside of the society who knows the anarchists, who knows that, okay, this is not the people who are burning barricades. This is like a people who are opposing the nuclear power plant, who are opposing the law against the parasites, the social parasites and so on and so forth. Um, and although the government is trying to create this narrative that the anarchists are provocators right now, it doesn't work. It doesn't like rest good inside of the society. Um, in the first day of the protests, um, the anarchists played also an important role in the first lines of the protests. So this kind of groups of active resistance among many others were also anarchists with their own experience of fighting back and so on and so forth. And this was reported also by the media. So the anarchists became um, a growing myth inside of the protest movement. Um, although when the protest went peaceful, let's say like that, it became harder to be present because the anarchist movement is not so big inside of the country. If you're talking about the amount of people, maybe 100, 150 people, tops. Um, in reality, it's even less who are active on the streets. And with protests going up to 300,000 people on the streets, with your small group of people, you can't actually affect any kind of political narrative. So in the first uh, months after the riots, after the uprising, the the role of the anarchists started growing down and down and down till the moments when the escalation was happening. So in certain places where the escalation happened and the anarchists participated, it was an important role, but then again, brushed away. In the last weeks, um, the anarchists came back to the scene as an organized group inside of the protest, because eventually most of the people are sticking to their smaller family groups or friend groups, and there are no clear organized political groups on the streets. And the anarchists, maybe being 30, 40 people at, during the demonstration, are still in this smaller group within this 100,000 people are presenting this possibility for organized struggle. 
And for some people, this is resonates. So they want to be part of this organized struggle and not any more of the crowd. Um, meanwhile, although with growing influence, the anarchists are also um, in the last two months had quite serious problems with the repressions. Uh, we had people arrested. So six or seven people are right now in prison waiting for trial for um, participating in riots or organizing riots. And this is like up to eight years, I think, in the prison. And um, dozens and dozens of people were detained and spent the short-term arrests of like 15 days, 10 days in prison or re-arrested. Um, so there was a lot of repression supplied and also the political police is searching for, uh, sometimes specifically for the anarchists to target the, the organized group inside of the protest as it happens everywhere else as well. Um, as for demands of the protests, they are really simple. And this is one of the things I think that got um, this rallying potential that we are not talking about politics. We're not talking about, okay, whether we are anti-capitalist or whatever. And people united around this really simple release of political prisoners, Lukashenko's resignation, new elections, and investigation of crimes against, uh, against the people during the protests. The last was added later on. And this first three were... Um, they are at the very beginning of the protest. And within that, that's like kind of a put in the stone. So nothing is changing since two months um, uh, towards the new demands or something like that. As for current and former structures, um, at certain point after like a couple of weeks, uh, the opposition and certain, let's say, bigger players in the game try to create a coordination committee which would be a power within the protest movement that is supposed to talk to the Lukashenko and talk him out of the power. Didn't work out so well. Most of the people from the coordination committee are right now um, in the prison or left the country from the tops. And um, the groups that are left do not present any kind of voice inside of the protest movement. Then there is Tikhanovska, who was supposed to be elected as a president and then get the new election waves. Um, she is now in Lithuania, as you might have heard, and she's also doesn't, she also doesn't have any political power within the political movement. She can make calls, she can tell people what to do, but at the end of the day, she doesn't have any political party, she doesn't have any groups that would actively support. It is more like a decentralized whatever that would say, okay, yeah, that makes sense, we are going to support her. Some people support her, whatever conditions are, the others are critical of her. And um, yeah, as I said, there is no strong political power from Tikhanovska. Then there are a lot of telegram channels all around. There are smaller channels where you can get uh, information on how to be a radical protester, the bigger channels that are reporting news. And then there are thousands of chats, the bigger chats where you would have 15,000 people who don't read anything and they just write their thoughts. And the other ones which are organized more on the local level, um, that are playing an important role in the organizing of the neighborhood assemblies and so on. Um, and this is another part, uh, since the repression started and intensified and people were pushed from the streets, people moved to the neighborhoods where they started gathering with their neighbors and started talking about participating in the protest, but also um, doing some cultural events, doing social events, doing kind of a political organizing locally. Then a month ago, after quite a severe crackdown on the protesters. Um, the whole kind of telegram community of Belarus was calling for creation of self-defense groups that were supposed to fight back the police repressions in case they're happening. Um, this, unfortunately, although called in such a massive and must never happened. The smaller groups appeared, uh, but they were not appearing from some kind of a self-defense perspective, but rather just people who are situationally try to defend the other people from the police. Um, and as well, the driver groups um, appeared at the very beginning of the protest. They had an idea that they are from one side going to support the protesters. So they're going to drive the protesters away from the hotspots into security. But then on the other side, during this de-escalation period, the idea was that the drivers are going to become another force to fight the dictatorship, to block the streets, to prevent the police from movement, but also do the uh, economical damage. Unfortunately, the economical damage part never happened. The scale of the protest of drivers didn't go so far to be visible and critical to for the protests. Um, 
So the current situation, as I mentioned, uh, most of the protests are gone and people are basically smashed and only Minsk is still resisting the repressions. Um, the radical part of society is heavily repressed. Um, there are 400 criminal cases plus, I don't know, hundreds that we don't know about. Inside of those criminal cases, there are thousands of people who are capable of actively resisting. And a lot of them um, who are not sitting in jail and awaiting for trial right now left the country already. And they left to Ukraine, they left to Poland, they left to Lithuania, where the local government said that they are going to support the protesters in case the repressions are going to be heavy. Um, Sunday marches are in decline. So if the, in the first week there were 300, 200,000 of the protesters in Minsk, right now we are talking about maybe 50,000. It is still huge for Belarus that didn't have 50,000 people for the last 26 years. But we can see the negative dynamic happening. The people are getting tired not only of uh, repressions, but also getting tired of kind of pointless going around the cities. And this is affecting the dynamic pretty hard. And also the peaceful protest is not actually happening right now. And we see that people are just gathering and start walking around the city without any aim. So there are no, um, there is no content to the protest. Maybe there will be an, some kind of a name for the protest uh, called on the Telegram, but all in all, no targets. There is no perspective on what should we do to move on rather than, you know, we just gather and we keep pushing. And then the more we gather, the longer we gather, everything will be fine and the things will be good. And this is um, the situation where we are right now. And we are really critical of what is going to happen tomorrow. Like we have critical expectations and really afraid that tomorrow will be some kind of a fucked up um, case. Uh, parallel to that, police said that they are ready to use firearms. They are ready to use all the um, shit they have to suppress the protesters. Um, so there is a clear escalation side from the, uh, from the police and from the government. But on the other side, protesters are still kind of pushing towards the peaceful protest, no resistance, and so on and so forth. And this is pretty much what I wanted to tell you, apart from um, the point of helping. Some people are always asking about help and how you can support the resistance in Belarus. Uh, one of the important parts is get informed, stay informed, keep on getting updated on what is happening in the country. This is an important part to actually fight the propaganda that is happening from Belarus, but also from Russian side. Um, the other side is support the anarchists. I mean, we are at the anarchist book fair. Donate to Anarchist Black Cross Belarus that is supporting the political prisoners. Donate to the other um, anarchist groups that are participating in the protest in the country that need money for the basic things. I mean... Making a banner doesn't cost so much for the Westerners, but making a banner in Belarus for the protesters might be kind of economically burdening. And this is something that the people are collecting money as well for, for a so-called street fund, where we can use money for, um, yeah, for the actions, for making up actions, for buying equipment, and so on and so forth. Um, so feel free to go to the ABC website, ABC Belarus, um, abc-belarus.org, or to the anarchist group Pramen, which is like P-R-A-M-E-N.org, and donate to those groups. And this is like the easiest way you can support actually the movement. Decide for yourself that you can donate like 5% of your salary per month to the revolution in Belarus. And this will help incredibly to every single anarchist that is fighting against the dictatorship. Right. So we will jump, I think, to the question section if we still have some questions. Uh, uh, yeah, first of all, first thank, of all you, um, thank you, um, Arangum, again, Arangum and again, and a bit of uh, feedback. Um, thank you for that. That was uh, very educational and very broad. And yeah, I've uh, certainly right. learned a lot. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. I hope, I hope it was understandable at all because I just hear myself in the headphones and I'm not sure if I understand what I'm saying. No, it was uh, very understandable and very good. Um, the questions in the chat are mostly about um, how, how people can help the struggle and how they can do it. And you kind of covered that at the end there. But uh, w what are good news sources? Like aside from the anarchist networks, is there 
you say there's no uh, independent media coming out. Is there like a Telegram group which might be useful to people or anything like that? Do you know? I think, I mean, one of the things for following what is happening in Belarus, you most probably would need Telegram. I'm not really the biggest fan of the whole technology because it's connected to your phone and shit. But this is where the news are spread right now in Belarus. Maybe a little bit of Twitter, but mostly it's Telegram. And the biggest, uh, if you're following like just news and what is happening in news, um, you just follow something that is called Nechta. So N-E-X-T-A. And this is the channel that is reporting, kind of aggregating the news from all around. And uh, this would be your best source just to get the information. There are some anarchist Telegram channels as well, like ABC and they said this Pramin and then uh, some other groups. Um, it is actually pretty well uh, written in English. So if you go to the search engine and just write anarchist Belarus, you would get at least a couple of groups that you can go to the websites and see what's happening. Um, certain groups are trying to translate at least part of the news that are happening. Um, understanding the importance of spreading the news outside of the country. Right. Um, so, and and, so and one, on. um, one group from Russia that is um, Autonomous Action, and they are also aggregating news, but mostly in Russian. However, what is written in Russian right now is really easily translated with some online, I'm not going to make an advertisement for some commercial stuff, but for example, deeply.com, um, is really easily um, translated from Russian into English, German, French, Italian, and you will understand most what it's written there. Cool. Um, okay, so one of the big questions as it all kind of kicked off and all the misinformation came about was a uh, confusion about the red, the white, red, white flag. I'm just wondering if you could give us an explanation of that flag. A lot of people said it was a, an overtly fascist symbol, and I'm just wondering. Is there any truth to that? Right. So the flag itself was introduced in 1918. So before the fascists and Nazis appeared in an organized form. And it appeared in uh, the Belarusian Socialist National Movement. Um, so before the Soviet Union formed up and Belarus became Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, there were different forces inside of it. The Communist Party was trying to make it Belarusian Soviet uh, Socialist Republic. And there were um, nationalists who were influenced by the socialism and they wanted to have an independent country. And they had this flag, this white red flag. And this was for certain groups of nationalists inside of Belarus, but also for, well, for the whole spectrum of, uh, let's say, independentist statist groups in Belarus, including some socialists. This flag is kind of a flag of independent Belarus which was proclaimed in 1918, Belarusian National Republic. Um, it didn't last long. The Soviets came, and back then not Soviets, the Bolsheviks came and took over. And um, the next time the flag appeared was actually the Nazi occupation and the Nazi government organized the puppet government on the territory of Belarus with this flag. But the Nazi government was organizing puppet governments all around. So, for example, the current flag of the Russian Federation and also Ukrainian flag were also used for those puppet republics while they were Soviet, uh, part of the Soviet regime, right? Um, so all of those nationalist flags were used back then. And that's where the history comes that, okay, this flag is the flag of the Nazis and the horrors. The story is not over there yet. We are going um, to the point of collapse of the Soviet Union 1991 and the Belarusian, different, let's say, Belarusian nationalist groups come into power and they throw away the Soviet flag, the Soviet Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic flag. And they bring the white, red, white flag as a symbol of changes, democracy, liberalism, whatever they had in their head for the first, um, I think, first five years. And one of the most important parts of uh, the first years of, uh, Belar uh, of Lukashenko's building up his dictatorship was changing back the flag and the symbol of the country. So what he did is he made a reform that kind of reformed the constitution. He threw away this white, red, white flag and brought back the Soviet flag. 
uh, the Soviet flag without the star, but still this green red flag is the flag of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. So for a lot of people since then, since Lukashenko threw away this flag, this flag became a symbol of struggle against Lukashenko. So it's not um, connected neither with this Belarusian National Republic nor with the Nazi times, rather than with this sentiment of going away from the Soviet times. So we had this moment of liberalism, political uh, freedom and so on for a couple of years before Lukashenko became president. And that's the nostalgia that is connected with the flag. And right now, when the movement grew, it became more and more associated with the protest movement, with like anti-Lukashenko uh, momentum inside of the society. And the people who are on the streets are not this, you know, like thousands and thousands of Nazis who are going to make Belarus Belarusian and deport all the foreigners and so on. No, I mean, this is the people who are using this flag right now are from a political perspective, uh, some moderate socialists till um, right-wingers. Everybody's using that. Anarchists are not obviously using the national flags, but all the people who think the state is not the best, the not, not the worst idea that can happen to you are actually people who are wearing those flags or hanging those flags or whatever they do with them. So is there a, an element of the protest movement that is uh, ethno-nationalist, civic nationalist, like far right? Are they a presence in Belarus? Um, this is kind of, uh, from one side, easy question, no, right? But from the other side, a little bit more complicated question. Um, the right to far right political party, uh, Belarusian National Front, uh, is uh, opposed, was opposing the protest from the very beginning. And they saw that this is some kind of a provocation. And for really long, they were, um, since 2015, they were in this position of better Lukashenko with national independence than some kind of bizarre protest. And then we are becoming part of Russia. So those never managed to gather together and get any political presence inside of the movement. Then this traditional far right um, sphere of football hooligans is also not that present in Belarusian society because in 2015, after the right wing, but also left wing football hooligans played an important role in Maidan and in bringing down the U Ukrainian president, um, Belarusian special forces like the, the secret police made its best to actually repress most of organized football fans. So they destroyed the football scene from the right to the left. And um, there were smaller groups left that were never playing any serious role. So right now on the streets, there are still some football hooligan uh, groups, but they don't have any political agenda at all. They are more like, okay, we're going there to fight the cops and we're going to fight the cops against the dictatorship. And those are extremely small. Like this is the groups that are gathering maybe three, four, five people. And they are not very well connected and they do not present such a force that happens, for example, in Ukraine, where the first revolution of 2004 um, made space for more political freedom and more organizing for the Nazis as well as for the anarchists. In Belarus, this never happened. And as a result of that, um, they do not pose any, let's say, political, uh, they are not having any political force on the streets. Uh, good to know. <laughs> so, two other things that kind of jump out here is you mentioned the um, laws against social parasites and stuff. Um, is Belarus a state capitalist country? Like, what are the are these laws? Are they put into effect? Uh, what's the situation there? So the, the law was introduced in two thousand seventeen, and back then the idea was that every person who is not working, so not contributing to the state economy, has to pay a fine of, uh, I think this was like 200 euros back then per year um, to contribute to Belarusian economy. And this provoked a huge wave of um, struggle. There was a huge protest going on in the country for several months. And, and this was the first time, I think, for like 20 years where Lukashenko backed off. He said, okay, we are taking away the law and we are freezing it and so on. Then they repressed the movement, came back with the new law. And this new law is basically saying that uh, if you are not working for more than six months in a year, then you have to pay uh, the full costs of all the public services. 
Right now, some of them are subsidized. So you pay like, for example, 60% or 70% of the costs for your heating or for um, electricity. Um, and people who are not working, they have to kind of pay more. How much depends on how big is the flat, but all in all, that that's the plan. And right now, that's the still the social and political idea inside of the Belarusian state. So the people who are not working are not supposed to get support rather than they have to pay to Belarusian state to pay for healthcare, to pay for other people who are getting sub subsidized and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, that's the case with the, with the parasites, with the social parasites that they push. Um, you mentioned these uh, town hall discussion type things, uh, these people's assemblies or whatever we're calling them. And that kind of um, remind me of uh, the Spanish Civil War where the anarchists, the communists and the local villagers, whatever, get together and you know, discuss whether they're going to collectivize the community or make kind of decisions kind of like that. Is that how they work or is it more about like organizing methods that the local community is going to do? And at the same time, is um, the regions of uh, Belarus, is there a strong autonomous spirit or are they like the Belarusian national identity is strong? Well, talking about the, the, the regional ideas, right? Um, the Belarusian unity is pretty strong. Like there is no autonomous um, movements inside of the country, apart from one region where people are living in the kind of a swampy area where they have their own dialect of um, like a mixture of Belarus and the Ukrainian. Um, but all in all, um, the certain political autonomy is something that the anarchists are pushing right now, for example. And people are really positive about that. Uh, but all in all, this is not the topic that is discussed on those assemblies. So those assemblies are not really big in the sense of uh, there are no thousands of or hundreds of people. They're mostly organized inside of the neighborhoods with maybe 50 people coming maximum to the assemblies. And also it is not such a, let's say, vivid political um, structure. Many of those assemblies are not organizing any political events. They are not doing con discussions about what we are going to do in the next five weeks or something like that. They can say, okay, how do we go on the Sunday protest? But that for most of those places are the top of political organizing. Um, certain places, certain neighborhoods, maybe a couple, maybe five of them started having these political debates and they are searching, for example, places where they can gather for uh, a stage and moderated meeting where they can talk about further steps in the political struggle. But this, um, this movement presents just a small drop inside of this neighborhood assemblies. What they're doing mostly is cultural and social events. So cultural, there are a lot of musicians that are coming to play for, for the neighborhoods, um, doing performances, theater troops that are coming to entertain people, and also just gathering in the evening to drink tea, to talk about life. Um, in certain cases, people are super annoyed because they're talking about, uh, like, politically involved people are super annoyed because others are talking about uh, what they're going to do with their um, uh, gardens and which potato sort uh, they are going to plant and so on. So it doesn't have in every case, such a strong political content, right? right? And if we are going outside of Minsk, the neighborhood assemblies are extremely rare. So this movement is strong inside of the capital and in the smaller towns, it is small. And we see already right now a strong attempts to repress those. So for example, Grodna, a city of 200,000 people or 300,000 people, is now experiencing troubles and eight administrators in Telegram of those neighborhood assemblies were arrested. And that's what the basically government and police is trying to do. In Minsk, they can't control right now the spread of the movement because the city is big and there is a lot of things happening. But in the smaller towns with the smaller neighborhood assembly movement, they are actually repressing um, them quite successfully. Okay. <clears throat> So I've got two other questions here, uh, unless somebody jumps on the chat, we'll just go for them. I'm just wondering whether you can give us a, a brief history of the uh, anarchism in Belarus itself, like uh, 
you know, how, how long has there been an anarchist current? Uh, how has it dealt with the past 16 years of oppression of 26? Like, uh, right. Um, and we have for that question like five minutes, right? <laughs> uh, no, we're going for uh, another 15, technically, if you want, because we're running 10 minutes long. Okay. Um, so, the history of anarchism. The history of anarchism in Belarus started uh, when the history of anarchism in Russian Empire started. Um, but I wouldn't go that far. Um, so, the Soviet Union appeared, the anarchists were repressed. Um, by the end of the 30s, there was no anarchist movement in Belarus anymore. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, there was quite a bunch of anarchists appeared. Not well organized, but they started getting together. And a certain anarchist group appeared who were participating, for example, in the syndicalist movement in one of the cities uh, in Gomel, which is like a, an industrial 500,000 people uh, city, where anarchists managed to collect a union of 1,000 people and unite like several factories. Um, so after collapse of Soviet Union, anarchists started playing from the very beginning a really important role. The streams, anarch anarchist communism and anarchist syndicalism were kind of like the core of the whole idea. And this uh, spread till now. So most of the anarchist groups or most of the anarchists that you meet from Belarus would say, I'm an anarcho-communist or communist, or I'm an um, anarchist syndicalist, which the second part is not so popular right now. Um, so those streams of anarchism are kind of the most present inside of the society. And in the 90s, apart from syndicalist organizing, the anarchists were participating in the protest against the reform of the constitution, against all the steps that Lukashenko is making to build up the dictatorship, to consolidate his power within the state. And this was also an um, economical projects. For example, anarchists were, um, I think, the strongest force that was fighting against, um, or that was fighting for moratorium on uh, building the nuclear power plant in Belarus. Um, and this, they won. So in 1999, uh, the moratorium was uh, prolonged for 10 more years. Uh, so this was like an important big uh, movement. Also being present inside of the media, um, there was a huge newspaper um, of the the anarchist movement, um, which was a satirical one, but still was officially registered and you can buy it in the kiosks and so on and so forth. Um, so at that point, the anarchists were also um, starting the Indie Media Project in Belarus. And I think till 2010, the anarchists were from one side an important part inside of the oppositional movement, inside of the anti-Lukashenko movement, but from the other side, never taken seriously by the government because there were other forces that were bigger. So the oppositional parties that were having way bigger organizations, youth organizations, and so on and so forth. And in that sense, even an organized anarchist movement was never the main focus. And this changed in 2010 when we became like one of the biggest enemies of the Belarusian state. And so as a result of that, since 2010, although with all this massive support on the streets or whatever you call it, the anarchists slowly, step by step, were pushed by the repressions into a certain way of like underground, semi-underground structures. There are still some of the things that are happening openly, for example, Food Not Bombs Initiative or really free market um, events, but those are events that are public and they have like this public value that are a little bit hard to repress. But in general, anarchist organizing was happening in the last 10 years in a closed area. So if you are, um, trying to participate in some lectures or you're trying to make some lectures, it all will be underground. It all will be um, only for a certain group of people, invitation only, and so on and so forth. There were um, there was like a one space for some time where you could meet really easily, the concerts, the punk movement, punk mm -hmm. scene. Um, but for some time, I think till... 2017, 2018, uh, the police was also repressing people at the punk um, concerts. And this was like a really hard place to bring, for example, uh, merchandise. Normally you would go to the concert, you bring your books, you bring your t-shirts and you start spreading the info materials and so on and so forth. At certain point uh, in the history, like three, four years ago, this became also extremely hard because um, there were several cases when like the whole merchandise that you would bring to the concert would be confiscated and then destroyed by the police. And uh, right now the concerts are still happening and they're happening in this underground um, style. 
Um, so they're not openly published, whatever, but they're gathering in a certain punk scene, 100, 150 people. But there, the anarchist presence declined because of those political repressions, because of the targeting the anarchists inside of the punk scene. Um, right. So from one side, we are like mostly in the underground right now, mm. and we are anarchist communist, right? But from the other side, um, there are certain groups that maintain their presence inside of the society through um, really socially valuable events. Right. That was a short history. <laughs> and there is actually um, a brochure that is called, fuck, I don't remember. I mean, it's on this Primen website, right? Where um, there is a history of the first 10 years of the anarchist movement in Belarus in English, if you are interested about that. Some further reading there. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Like a homework <laughs> after listening to this talk. Um, I guess the last thing then is um what are what are your hopes going on? What 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 would you like to see the next uh few months bring? I think my hope is like the hope that is shared by most of the people that the Lukashenko fucks off. For some people, he should die. For some people, he should just go to Russia. But that's the biggest hope. I think, like, just to get rid of this fucking dictatorship that is just, you know, um, how would you say, uh, laying on our shoulders for the last 26 years. And to be honest, it was last 100 years because Lukashenko is also uh, our heritage from the Soviet times. So we want to get rid of that. We want to get rid of this constant governmental pressure to organize society, constant governmental pressure to prevent us from interacting with each other. So we are dreaming about the, we're not dreaming about being now on the streets, about the world of anarchism, anarchist federation or whatever. We are right now about really basic things of getting out of the underground and getting back to the people, getting back to the talking to the people and not being afraid that you will be beaten up, raped and uh, killed. So that's our major fucking hope. And I really hope that we are going to manage to get rid of this shit and we will fucking win. And we will have, I tell you, the longest party that ever existed in the history of the country. <laughs>